From Luminary, this is Therapy versus the World. I'm your host, Joe Nucci, and together with the help of our very special guests, we are going to arm ourselves with mental health knowledge so you can tackle the emotionally difficult topics in your life. We will break down popular psychology terms and concepts like narcissism, trauma, self-esteem, relationships, and more. Hopefully, you will leave each episode knowing yourself and others just a little bit better. Today, we are talking to Kareth Foster. Kareth is an author, speaker, comedian, and founder of Inversity Solutions, a revolutionary way to address diversity, inclusion, and belonging. Welcome, Kareth. I'm very excited to talk to you. Well, thank you so much for having me. What a treat. I've known Kareth for a while now, and I know that your story, there are so many ways that your story and what you're about applies to mental health. It's impossible to introduce in a introduction. But before you tell your story, I'm wondering if you have an idea of what are like, like, what's the elevator pitch? Like, what are like the two or three things that you hope people take away from the work you're doing? Well, number one, I hope people take away the fact that we we have more in common than we don't. And all of the things that we have been led to believe are uh, uh, have merit uh, because it distinguishes us from one another that they're they're surface things Mm -hmm. and the reality is we are human beings having a human experience um certainly at different times and through different lenses but we we're in this together and we certainly Mm -hmm. have more in common than we don't yeah and it's more relevant now more than ever. Although I feel like every time you and I talk every year, different things happen and it just continues to feel more important and more relevant. For the people who are listening, who are not familiar with your story, I would love you and feel free to take your time and just talk about who you are, how you came to do this work and how it all kind of ties together. And I'll definitely jump in as I have questions and thoughts sure. too. So I, I love that this is a conversation around mental health, because I'll I'll be honest, I think this really started with my own personal struggle growing up in an environment that wasn't very diverse and leaving me feeling like I was caught between two worlds, you know, as a, a black person growing up in a predominantly white space. Um, it wasn't that I had racial issues per se, but like anybody, you want to fit in, especially during adolescence. You're like, well, what is, what's missing? Like, why don't I feel like I'm part of something? You know, I, I was told that I wasn't black enough (laughs) by some of my black counterparts, uh, even teased about it, you know, by family members and, but I wasn't white either. So it's like, where do I belong? You know, but you talk white. Okay. What? You know, I, I I struggled with uh, severe asthma and allergies as a, a, a kid into my adolescence. So I was on a lot of prednisone, which is a horrible steroid if you ever had to deal with it. Um, and it makes you gain a lot of weight. It makes you incredibly emotional. Um, so that was added stress. So, you know, growing up with this, who am I, as everyone I think deals with, but then, you know, thinking, well, I, 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 I don't belong in any world. I'm an outcast. I'm an outsider. That was part of my path, but I thought, you know what? Maybe I can bring people together. Maybe there's a way. And I always thought media was going to be that way. So I went to school, college, to study broadcast journalism, that I was going to be the next Katie Couric, Connie Chung, Oprah Winfrey, totally dating myself here, um, because I wanted to be this beacon of light and truth. And that's what I got my degree in. I went to a very small women's college in Columbia, Missouri. I studied abroad at Oxford. Uh, came back, got my degree, and I moved to New York City to work for The View. And The View was, I would say, it was kind of my Devil Wears Prada. And there's a famous line from that movie, a million girls would kill for this job. Why are you miserable? And that was me. And I was miserable because I, I wasn't having the opportunity to express my creativity. And I'd wanted to be on the air And so there were things that I saw behind the scenes, which I'm very grateful for that experience. I mean, I learned how to write and produce and book. And to this day, I'm still friends with 75% of the people I started that show with. Um, Because, you know, who who wouldn't want to work for Barbara Walters? Um, And so that's why I took it. 
um, but not realizing what I was necessarily getting myself into. And the more I saw behind the veil of media and what's allowed, if you will, um, you know, you get to tell a version of the truth. And so while I was there uh, at The View, I found stand-up comedy, or rather it found me. And that was a, a twist that no one saw coming, especially my parents who were like, what, we paid for how much of private school in Oxford? Like, really? Um, but I loved it. And I I think one of the things I love most about stand-up was that, and I still believe this to this day, it, it, we're the island of misfit toys. It doesn't matter who you are, how big you are, how little you are, what your ethnicity is, what your gender is. You just have to be funny. That's that's the only rule and requirement. Um, but then, you know, you have to pay bills. So <laughs> my mother once said, please get health insurance. So I said, oh, fine. I started temping at Estee Lauder, their corporate headquarters in New York City. And I was there for just under a decade. And there were times when I'm like, why, God, am I here? This is not me. I'm not a nine to fiver. But now I know why I was there, because so much of the work that I do applies to corporate America. And I work very closely with human resource people. So I know their world. I know their challenges. I understand what they're going through, what they're trying to accomplish. And just as I was leaving Estee Lauder to start a production company, I get a call in September 2007 saying, hey, Kara, are you interested in a radio TV opportunity? I'm like, "Uh, yeah, of course. By the way, it's with Don Imus. Now, to refresh anyone's memory or enlighten anyone who'd never heard that name, Don Imus was like the original shock jock. He was the before Howard Stern. And he got in trouble in 2007 for calling the Rutgers women's basketball team nappy-headed hoes. And I remember watching it live on TV and thinking, oh, that was a bad move. And I saw it from multiple angles. I saw it from the purview of a comedian trying to riff, trying to be funny off the cuff and it not being funny or landing well. And I saw it from a black woman's perspective, like you did not just go there and say that. But I remember thinking this is an opportunity to marry all of my worlds, right? Mm -hmm. To have that broadcasting career, to be able to use humor and to be this beacon of light and truth. And that was my tale of two cities, the best of times, worst of times, um, dream job working for basically Satan because he was an addict who never sought recovery. So we never knew who we were going to get on a daily basis. And it was traumatizing. And I did have PTSD from it. Um, not an exaggeration, not as bad as some of the other people who'd work with him. I met one woman who for 20 years couldn't work because she was so traumatized from the abuse. Um, but I decided that was not gonna be me. But what that opportunity did do, and I'm still very grateful for it, was it opened my eyes to what was going on in the world of diversity and inclusion and DEI. And it made me think, you know, why after decades and decades and millions of billions of dollars spent on efforts in the name of diversity, why does it feel like two steps forward, 10 steps back? Mm. And that's what started me on the path with um, Inversity. It was initially called Stereotyped 101 and another catalyst for starting something and starting my entree into the college and university arena was the death of a young man, uh, Tyler Clemente. Uh, he took, he was a Rutgers student coincidentally, and he took his life by jumping off the George Washington Bridge. Mm. And I remember I hearing remember. that story and just being heartbroken that anybody should feel that alone for whatever it is they thought set them apart from everybody else. And and I thought, what can I do? How can I help? And that was initially the start of what I called Stereotyped 101 that evolved into adversity. There's so much I want to reply to, but before I do, can you tell those who are listening what exactly adversity Solutions is? Sure. So adversity Solutions is the name of my company. Inversity is a concept, it's a methodology. It's a way of taking the division out of diversity. Because think about it, the word diversity, I, I love to play with words as an author, as a speaker and a comedian. Um, the first three letters of diversity is D-I-V, right? What other letters, words start with that? Divide, mm. division, <clears throat> divorce. <laughs> and we're shocked that diversity is it bringing everyone together? Yeah. It's literally right in front of us. So I thought, okay, let me see if I can flip the script, literally mm -hmm. and figuratively. And I created inversity. And the idea is 
not to sweep anything about diversity under the rug. It's still, you know, we have to acknowledge that there are things and issues that exist in the world. But what if we, instead of focusing on all the things that separate and divide us, expand the definition of diversity to include diversity of thought and ideas, and also make it a a point to understand that, like, if we have more in common, why don't we focus on that? Why don't we shift the focus to what it is we have in common, how we can be truly inclusive of one another, but most importantly, and I believe powerfully, how can we be introspective, meaning understanding your value and worth so you can see it in someone else. And I think that's where a lot of the traditional DEI has gotten things wrong because it's been messaging, like trying to penetrate the, 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 from the outside in. And so much of this work, it, it, nothing's going to change unless we ourselves change how we come to the table in certain conversations, how we treat other people. But it has to start with how we treat ourselves. And I think yeah. that's really been lost until now. There's so much I want to. There's so much I want to reply to. So let's just take it from the top. I was taking some notes here. So you talk about growing up. Growing up, not being black enough, not being white enough, wanting to fit in, which is, of course, an anxiety that adolescents go through at that age. And it's something that lasts with us throughout our lifetime. You know, I don't know anyone who doesn't like fitting in. Often I notice, I don't know if you see this, but if I ever get to know someone who's kind of, you know, contrarian, doesn't like to fit in, they kind of have their little like groups of other contrarians and other kind of, you know, they're all kind of banding together. Um, And... For me, it really brings up this idea of what is identity? Identity is not something that's completely objectively defined. You identify as something, but it's also not something that's completely subjectively defined either. And here's how you know, if you and I are walking down the street and someone calls out, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to come after you, you N-word or you cracker or whatever it is, if it's the former, I may stop and I may be like, oh my God, who is saying that? But I'm not going to have a moment of that person might be talking to me. Mm-hmm. You know, just like with the latter, you won't. You, I mean, you may, you, you'll still have an emotional response. And I like this example because I think it highlights how identity and the politics of identity are often negotiated. It's not completely objective. It's not completely subjective either. In your example, I you felt like yourself and people were trying to negotiate what that was with you. Yes. And it sounds like that was very, very hard, particularly when you don't fit an easy mold. You know, it's yes. easier to categorize yes. someone. It takes less cognitive thinking. I mean, as far as, I, I'm not sure exactly what the question was there, but uh, you're 100% right. You know, when... You are struggling with an identity and you have a subsect of people that are trying to put an identity on you. Mm-hmm. That that's really where the conflict was for me. You know, I was just like, yeah. well, I'm just I'm just Kareth. Right. right? I, I, I am black. I never wanted to be anything but. I never had any desire to change my ethnicity. You know, I may have wanted blue contacts every now and then, but I always wanted my skin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you <Yeah>. know? <laughs> um you know, identity is it is subjective and it is so personal and it, it it's it's malleable, right? Mm-hmm. Because you can identify as oh I'm, I identify as a Democrat, I identify as a Republican, I identify as this. Like this is the mm-hmm. where I feel my allegiance to something, mm-hmm. and that can become part of your identity. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's when we select an identity that. We're, I mean, g- willing to die on that hill for it mm-hmm. because that's all we are and that's who we are. And if other people can't see it and accept it, like it's so mm-hmm. personal. Why, why does anybody else have to buy into your identity? Right. Mm-hmm. I, I, and I, I say that coming from a place of self-love, not mm-hmm. from a place of judgment toward anyone else, because I had to, I had to go there. Mm-hmm. How dare anyone else try to put something on me when it's my life and how I feel about myself. So I had to grow up a little bit. I had to take personal responsibility for how much power Mm. I was going to give 
to right. anyone outside of myself. Family, lovers, friends, just the people out there in society. Mm. Because that was an energy drain on me. And it took a lot yeah. of my energy. And it robbed me of a lot of yeah. joy mm. and confidence. Yeah. For me, it brings up this idea of self respect is often upstream of self-esteem mm. and self-love because sometimes it can be, I, I imagine, maybe I, it's better to ask it as a question. I imagine at times it was difficult to have that self-love, particularly when you have those external forces kind of um, influencing you or trying to influence you. It took and, decades. Yeah. It took decades. And, you know, since we're talking about this and on this topic, you know, I, I had a breakdown. I spent part of my 16th year, um, a month in an adolescent psychiatric facility because the struggle mm. was so real. Yeah. Who am I? Definitely. Would you, would you mind sharing a little bit about that? It's a very vulnerable disclosure, but it's also a very, it is not an uncommon experience. Absolutely. So I, I mean, yeah. I, I don't talk about it a lot. Um, I do mention it in my book, but one of the things that I, I always want people to know and understand is that there's no shame in getting help yeah. and seeking help, especially if you think you're, you know, might be at the end of your rope. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very grateful for that experience because not to say that my problems weren't significant and what I was dealing with wasn't heavy on me, on my mm -hmm. heart in my life. But when I got there, you know, I had quite the awakening to what other mm. people's lives were like. Yeah. I was the only person who didn't go to AA meetings. I was one of the mm. only people who didn't go to CD meetings, chemical dependency. I didn't go mm. to SA meetings, sexual assault. Like I realized how very fortunate I was. And I'm like, wait, I'm, 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 upset because like I'm overweight and people tease me and I just I'm struggling with who I like mm -hmm. what and again yeah. not to demean what pain that caused internally in the yeah. struggle but when you have the opportunity to put things in perspective like that yeah it's life-altering mm -hmm. it's life-altering and that was honestly that was where things pivoted for me when mm -hmm. I did make the decision of you know what I'll be damned mm -hmm. if I let anybody else Tell me how I'm supposed to feel about myself or who I'm supposed to be. Now, I wish I could say that was the end of that identity struggle for other people because I right. did go into entertainment. I did go into comedy. Mm -hmm. um, I started in New York, which I'm very grateful that I did because I probably would have been terrified to start comedy somewhere else and then go to the Big Apple, right? Like ignorance <laughs> is bliss. Fair enough. Um, yes. <laughs> but I didn't fit the mold there either. You know, I wasn't the sassy black girl who rolled her neck and talked about baby daddies and getting the stereotype, you know? Right. I wasn't the stereotype. So for a long time, people just, they didn't know what to do. I wasn't the cute, blonde, kind of dirty girl. They didn't know what to do with me. They mm. literally didn't know what to do with me. Because, you know, they're always looking for the next Chris Rock, the next Amy Schumer, the next, you know, and I, I didn't fit any of those. Like, I was my own person. Mm. And I lost a lot of gigs because of that. But I also refused to play a character that I didn't want to. It, the experience of seeing what other people were going through ended up being an empowering one for you. Yes. A different, a different person might be listening to this and maybe they've gone to inpatient as an ad adolescent. Maybe they haven't. And they could see how other people have gone through, you know, quote unquote, worse experiences, and yet they're still being impacted the same. For you, it was an empowering moment, an epiphany. Mm -hmm. For others, that might actually compound their shame. What might you say as someone that's been through that experience? What might you say to that person? It's a choice. It's a choice. Yeah. And I know that sounds oh so simple. I, I, I'm not saying that it's easy and it happens overnight, but... Right. You have to you have to have almost like a pro and cons list for yourself. Yeah. You know, what are the benefits? And I, I, I teach this when I I coach executives, when I work with groups and organizations, you know, 
what are the long-term benefits of holding on to this? Mm-hmm. What are the short-term benefits of holding on to this? And you make that list. What are the long-term benefits of letting this go? Yeah. What are the short-term benefits of letting this go? And sometimes the benefits, they're not necessarily positive. Like the benefit can be, well, I get to be the victim. I get to blame mm-hmm. someone else. I get yeah. to always say, this is why things don't work out for me. So it's not my fault. I talk about victimhood a lot in my content. And one of the things I keep coming back to is this idea of what's worse than being depressed or having some sort of mental disability or whatever it is. It's dealing with that and dealing with victimhood consciousness. Mm. It, it, it makes it worse, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. no matter how you slice it. You talk about not being, not fitting a certain mold and how previously it held you back. You lost gigs. People didn't know how to categorize you. I want to talk about that a little bit. And the way I want to explain it is what I call the the dilemma of the bisexual in a bar. Hmm. So yeah. if you're man or woman, let's say you're bisexual and you're in a gay bar, does it is is it serving you in a meaningful way or how might it serve you in a meaningful way to clarify that you are also like the out group, like a heterosexual in a different way. When the other gay men meet you in the gay bar and then they hear that you kind of, they, they, they can't put you in a box, just like those people couldn't put you in a box. What I've observed is that people, there can be hate, there can be stereotyping, but I think there's also just a genuine anxiety of how do I categorize you? Mm-hmm. I don't have enough mental space to figure out what to place you. Are you are you going to hit on me? Are you going to be my friend? Are you my competition? Like what's happening? Uh, I I don't understand. Similarly, you take the bisexual, you put them in a straight bar or her or them, put them in a straight bar, and they're clarifying to everyone that they're bisexual. Well, like you just introduced this interesting context again. Are you hitting on me? Are you my wingman? Right, are you my right, friend? Right, are you my right. competition? It's it takes more thinking is my point. Mm, It takes more cognitive energy. energy. And I think that you could apply that to other issues and nuances of identity outside of sexuality, whether it's gender or race or whatever it might be. People can't categorize. They don't have a simple schema. They don't know how to sort you. And that takes more thinking. And if they don't have the energy or they don't have the um, education or awareness or experience, I think it can be disorienting with them. And that's where I think communication and connection and opportunity breaks down. I'm wondering, A, what you think about the dilemma, and B, how you might better understand your experience of well, dealing with identity. I think you just described why the internet is a shit show of vitriol <laughs> <laughs> and people getting mad at one another because they're not even taking the time. They don't have the mental capacity to, to see a broader picture than yeah. what has been, you know, kind of set up in their own, in their own mm-hmm. brains. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I, I think that my experience, you know, I, I used to lament being the social butterfly in high school, you know, and I, cause I didn't have a click. I hung out with mm-hmm. the cheerleaders and the jocks. I hung out with the, you know, the, the, the theater and debate teams. I was, I was all over. And I used to think it was my curse. Now I realize it was my blessing. Yeah. And I think that that's really how people have to, if they want to find joy mm-hmm. in their existence, they have to find their blessings. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for those who aren't religious in any way, like I, I find your, your gifts, your talents, your, your special sauce, your unicorn dust, <laughs> you know? And I think that, you know, we, we try so hard to belong, like belonging is so, it's such a part of human nature. I mean, it's number three on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. It's why people join gangs. It's why people join synagogues and mosques and churches. It's why people join fraternities and sororities. It's why people join hate groups. Because they want to belong. I mean, that desire to belong is so strong. People do some things that do not always serve them. Yeah. And I think if we can keep that in mind when we are looking to try to belong to a certain group, like, what about belonging to yourself? Like, nobody ever talks about that. 
Do you belong to you or do you belong to what society's put on you? Yeah. It goes back to the self-love comment earlier. I alluded to self-love, self-esteem, self-respect. You know, you I mean, you can slice love and try to destruct it, deconstruct it in a number of different ways. But what I really like about your question, do you belong to yourself? Is it something like, where did you plant your flag in the sand? And are you okay with where you plant it? Are you going to stand by that yeah. decision? You know, this is who I am. And it, it could be an issue of identity or it could be something, I'm a, I'm a gym rat. I'm a yeah. foodie. Yeah. I, I love TV. No, I prefer movies. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be super dramatic no. and intense. It's all about, are you going to A, make a choice, but B, do you have enough respect in yourself and in the choice where if someone else made a different one that it doesn't necessarily unravel you and i don't even know if it's respect as much as it's confidence mm. right and and those two things can go hand in hand for sure yeah but you know respect confidence boundaries all of these things that that edify us mm. right who we are so that we're okay with us i mean I know people in their 50s and 60s and 70s who still aren't comfortable. Now, it, it does help getting older without question. Mm -hmm. yeah. You you realize, you know, you know what? I'm not going to give my energy to that anymore, to mm -hmm. that conversation. To I'm not going to entertain people who think this way or want to, you know, make me feel a certain way or try to make me feel. Because first of all, they have no power to make me feel anyway. That's all in me. That mm -hmm. ownership. You know, I talk about that in my book. You can be perfect. You can be happy. Mm. Owning the fact that no one else has the power to make you happy. That is that is a blow to many people's systems. Yeah. Because we, we've been brought up to think, well, you know, if I meet the right person, I'll be happy. Right? If I have the right yeah. job, I'll be happy. If I, you yeah. know, have these kids, I'll be happy. If I get this degree or have this title or live in this yeah. neighborhood, Right? Happiness mm -hmm. really genuinely has to come within. I know it sounds so cheesy, yeah. but it's so true. Mm -hmm. It's just so true. And when you realize that, you know, happiness is a choice, but it's also not a constant, mm -hmm. that's that's when you can get over that hill. You know, I, I the analogy I often use is that, you know, a heartbeat monitor. We've all seen the EKGs mm -hmm. where it goes up and down, up and down. When yeah. you got the highs, enjoy the heck out of them, right? Yeah. And then when you got the lows, know that those are temporary. The only time, just like in life, the only time you were ever in trouble is when you got that straight line. Mm. Yeah. But we've been trained to believe that if you're not happy all the time, something's wrong with you. Nonsense. Mm. Yeah. Nonsense. Yeah. Right. It's life. It's just life. And it's okay. You know, is I've had the uh, privilege, I guess you could call it, of providing psychotherapy to people all along the socioeconomic continuum. When I was in school, it was a predominantly Medicaid caseload, a very high pain private practice clients, now everyone in between. And something that I've noticed across the socioeconomic continuum, but I think it's easier to see the significance of it if you're on the wealthier end, is if you have that straight line, if you're plateauing for too long, even if you're plateauing from a really like good place, like mm -hmm, a high mm -hmm. place on the chart, people will do something to make it go lower just to make it interesting. <laughs> I mean, they really will, you know? And I'm not, and I don't think that that's, that's not bad or that's disordered. I, I think that's life. You don't necessarily want it to be monotonous the whole time. You want a story. Yes. You know, you, yes. you want an adventure. A hundred percent. It's we're not supposed to be like everything's not supposed to be predictable. You know, um, how do you how do you know what feels good if you don't know what bad feels like? Totally. I mean Brene Brown really popularized this notion, and I think it's in one of her gifts in terms of media presence, is you don't get the good stuff if you let in the bad stuff. It's 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 kind of oh, like well, yeah. it's kind of like falling in love. You know, you don't actually get to access those intense feelings of, of passion and closeness and comfort and belonging and, and all of that without risking, you know, feeling misunderstood. You know, maybe they prioritize their feelings over yours 
one time and that hurts, it goes, it goes hand in hand. Have I ever told you the, uh, the porcupine metaphor? No, please. Uh, so this is, uh, maybe my favorite distinction I, I, I learned in school. And it was the first book they, they made us read in my master's program. So <laughs> it was all downhill from there. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but the, idea is that the porcupine is the perfect metaphor for human intimacy. So porcupines travel in their little, I think they're called troops. I'm not actually sure what a porcupine is called. Okay. Um, you can let, you can let us know in the comments if you're seeing this right. clip, <laughs> somebody knows, um, but let's say it's troops. And so okay. the porcupines, they, they travel in their little troops and storms come in life and storms always come in life. It's inevitable. Sure. That's the up and down of the EKG, like you talked about. And so the porcupines, they'll They'll huddle not just for warmth, but for, for protection and sure. closeness and safety. And the closer they get, the more likely they are to accidentally poke each other with their yeah. quills. And so that's the dilemma of human intimacy. You don't actually get the closeness and the warmth if you don't risk getting hurt sometimes. And people, I, I see it all over social media. I've, um, I talk about it when I facilitate therapy. I've heard it from my own therapist. What's important is not that you never get hurt. It's that, but can you repair can you make up in the exactly. aftermath? And it seems like we've lost that sometimes in culture, particularly around topics of identity. We've certainly lost resilience because mm. I think you know we've become accustomed to telling people that they're fragile. Mm. And I think that happens a lot in colleges and universities. There's a book called The Coddling of the American Mind. And actually, mm. the movie is about to be released. And I was not in mm. the movie, but I did get to contribute to the book. And in it, you know, yes, we, of course, talk about the rise of social media and those aspects, but there is also the element of, you know, when did we stop telling people they were resilient? When did we stop, you know, championing victimhood and yeah. letting people think that, you know, what, it, they, they won't be able to recover because that's, that's not true. Yeah. It's simply not true. Um, mm -hmm. I do have to say, when you told that porcupine story, all I could think of was, it is a miracle that we ever get baby porcupines. <laughs> totally. Like considering what they have to do to make, make it happen, like forget a thunderstorm. <laughs> yeah, that's you put. You, it's vulnerable, right? And mm -hmm. life is vulnerable. And I learned that doing comedy. I'll be. I'll be honest. I I really mm. learned that doing comedy because stand up comedy, love it or hate it, it is the most vulnerable art form that exists because it's all you, all yeah. you on that stage. Unless you have a comedy partner, but that rarely happens. It's yeah. your words, your thoughts, your ideas, your face, your body, your voice mm -hmm. for complete yeah. acceptance or complete rejection. Yeah. And that's also why it's a bit addictive, I think. And it's why some people too use as therapy. And it's why some people, mm -hmm. you know, try it once and like never again. But it's also <laughs> why some people can't get it out of their system. Yeah. Because the high that you get from stand up, I, I, I've mm -hmm. not been a drug user, but I can't imagine a greater high than having mm. an entire room of people laugh at something you think is funny too. Yeah. It just fills your soul. And laughter is cathartic and it's healing. And, you know, physiologically, there are things that happen when we laugh, which is why, yeah. you know, one of the mottos that I use is, you know, if you can laugh at it, you can get through it. Yeah. And a lot of comedy comes from pain. You know, there's the equation mm -hmm. of tragedy plus time equals comedy. <laughs> yes. And that's not to say that it's about poking fun of horrible things that have happened. But think about the people who are like some of the most famous comedians, right? They're Jewish people. They're black people. They're people who've had like trauma mm -hmm. in their communities for a long time. And that's how we that's how we heal that's how we that's how we 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 move forward so we don't stay stuck in the pain so Kareth, there's i'm guessing that there's someone listening to this assuming they haven't just turned it off out of sheer repulsion turned us off what <laughs> someone is thinking yeah it's a nice thought but the system but it's too hard, well, whatever it is. There are, there are people that feel that way. I see them in the comment section. I meet them mm -hmm. in life. As, as you said, it almost feels on the rise in some ways. Um, what would you say to that person, the person that, that maybe just isn't buying what you're selling? I'd say for all, you're, all the reasons you know. 
I would let them know they're completely entitled to feel that way. And I, I'm mm. not here to force anything on anyone. I'll be, I, mm. that doesn't work. That's not how you mm. win friends and influence people. One thing mm. I would like to remind people, yeah. regardless of your level of spirituality, again, your religious affiliation, if you even have a religion, mm -hmm. the fact that you exist is a miracle. Yeah. And I speak this as someone who knows how hard it can be to get pregnant. <laughs> mm. And scientifically, biologically, the fact that you exist yeah. is nothing short of miraculous. And I believe that that means that you have a purpose. Mm -hmm. Now, you may not know what that purpose is right now. You may be struggling. And I get it. I've been there. God knows. I've been there. But yeah. know that if you can start just with grasping the concept that you're here for a reason, that you exist mm -hmm. for a reason, that your presence, your hearing this, your being mm -hmm. able to breathe and walk and move and function, and you know, if you have that ability, means that you know anything is possible. Like that's the world that I live in, and I didn't always live in that world. Yeah. I didn't. And I, I'm not saying that's where I live all the time either. Like I'm not married right. freaking Poppins. You know? yeah. <laughs> like everything's wonderful. I don't have little birds land on my cup of tea. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's real life. So I have to remind myself, right? Sometimes I have to read my own book to be motivated. Sometimes I have to get it from a podcast. I have yeah. to hear a comedian talk. I have to you know, but the fact that you exist to experience life, joy, loss, pain, fatigue, hope, like yeah. that is so powerful. Yeah. And as long as you're here, that that's a gift. Yeah. And I know it doesn't always seem like that. I know it doesn't. Mm. But it is. It really is. Because this is it. This is a life we've got. Mm. Yeah. And and I know there are people that have suffered, there are people who have had trauma, there are people that have been abused, there are people that are probably going through abuse right now. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, all I can say is, you know, don't give up on yourself. Yeah. Right? There really there is light at the end of the tunnel. And if if the, if you exist, it means you can do something to change it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of people think, well, this is just my life. They've resigned themselves. This is just you know, yeah. I am what happened to me. No, you're not. Mm. One of the chapters is my of my book is, you know, ask why this is happening for me versus right. to me. Right. And just that little juxtaposition of those two prepositions. Why is something happening for me? Why did I go through that awful period? Oh, so yeah. I can be like, you know what? I got through that. That didn't take me out. Yeah, They tried. It tried. But I'm still here. Yeah. For me, it also brings up looking at someone from the outside. You see the record deal, the podcast launch, the wedding day. You don't see the thousands of rejected auditions. You don't see the hours of work I put into content You know, before getting a podcast. You don't necessarily see all the horrible, maybe even abusive and traumatic relationships and dates before the marriage, particularly in our you know, social media, soundbite, Instagram mm -hmm. world. Everyone thinks that everybody else is ju just perfect. And it's such an unfair standard to impose on other people. You know, it, it dehumanizes them. It disempowers you. you know, it shirks responsibility from you. And it erases the fact that these things take time. You said your journey to self-love, like it took years. Oh, decades. Yeah. Is it fair to say that if you could have spoken to yourself then that you would have said, it's going to get so much better. It's going to take a long time, but it's worth the wait. Uh, it's worth the baby steps. I always say, you know, they say, what would you say to your 18 year old self or, yeah. you know, 20 year old self? I say, to st stop. First of all, stop worrying. You're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but that, yeah, it, it does get better. It absolutely gets better. And that doesn't mean you don't have the, the lows and the heartaches and the, totally the, the crappy yeah. scenarios that you do, you do, yeah. but 
you you choose you choose mm. if you're gonna let it take you out or if you're gonna let mm. it make you stronger. And that's that's what I think a lot of people don't recognize or understand that you do have a choice. Mm. You do, you do. Yeah. Regardless of what you've been told, what anybody has tried to you know put on you, you have a choice. Am I gonna believe what they said about me, or am I gonna believe what I know is my truth? Mm. Yeah, that goes back to what you said earlier. Speaking of which, I want to double click on something you said earlier. You said that a lot of the current conversations and structures and ways of thinking about diversity, inclusivity, belonging, it's this outside in messaging. Yeah. Can you tell me exactly what you meant by that? Well, I meant that, you know, a lot of the trainings that people do, especially like on unconscious bias, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, you know, look at, look at what other people's lives are like. Look at how privileged you are. Look at how you treat other people. Right. It's very externally focused, mm. right? Yeah. Instead of saying, how do you treat yourself? Mm. What, do you, what do you wake up in the morning, look in the mirror and say to you? Mm -hmm. Most of us say pretty horrible things. Yeah. And then we're expected to be kind and loving to other people. We can't even be kind and loving to ourselves. Yeah. So how in the world do they think that type of programming is going to have a lasting effect? Right. From what I've experienced from that programming, and I had that education in undergrad, in graduate school, there was a lot of focus on diversity and counseling, which is super important. But the, the outside, it, it made me think of this idea of loci of control. Are you familiar with this in psychology? No. It's, it's this idea of where do you assign the control? Is it internal? Is it more internal or is it more external? And what they have found, no surprise, is that if it leans external, if you assign more control to things outside of you, mm -hmm. you are more likely to be depressed Mm. more likely to be anxious. And this got brought up in school. And I always thought it was so interesting because people would, would critique this finding and they would say, well, that's a very, um, well, that's a very like Western and individualistic finding. And I always remember thinking, and because, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. because I actually have friends and classmates in graduate school who came from, you know, more collectivist societies, non-Western societies. Like I'm thinking of a, a classmate of mine who came from Asia and they said, oh, like learning about these concepts was pretty great. <laughs> they were like, it's actually very, very empowering. And so, but that's, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a tangent. I, I, I just know that when it comes to some of these issues, I love what you're adding because for one thing, if you're not gonna, if you don't feel like you can make a change or make your own circumstances better, it's gonna be really, really hard to improve your mental health. Now, yeah. at the same time, we need to be cautious of an extreme stance on that. For example, people who think that they can do anything, even though the evidence is otherwise, we might call that a delusion of grandiosity. You mean like all so, the self-made whatever's, which is a <laughs> complete and utter fabrication. Nobody's okay. self-made anything. You have to have other people. Yes, I was just, I had a great interview um, a great interview with my friend Jimmy. Um, we talked about mental health and high achievement and performance. And he has he had such this humble leadership style. And if you haven't heard the episode, please go and, and check it out. It's it was really, really great talking to him because he's he's so there's something just so earnest about the way he goes about it. He goes, I need so much help to do what I've done, you know? And how great to hear. And that's, you know, I think that's another thing that we forget. And that's actually one of the chapters of the book. Ask for help. There is no weakness in that. And yet mm -hmm. we've somehow grown up thinking, well, if I ask for help, then I'm not going to mm -hmm. look like I have it all together or I'm going to show I'm incompetent or nobody does anything just by themselves. Schools don't run on their own. Companies don't. Right. Why do you think people put help wanted signs up? Yeah. And companies, why do you think people look for cap uh, capital venture? Uh, uh, I'm blanking. <laughs> I'm actually not sure where you're going with it. Oh, no, <laughs> CVs. I just, you know, capital venturists. Yeah. That's what I was trying mm -hmm. to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because people need money. People need help. And, and there are people who want to invest in a business, but they don't yeah. want to start one. Yeah. We need each other. 
Um, mm. We need to know that it is okay to ask for help. And in fact, not only is it not a sign of weakness, it's actually a sign of courage and bravery. And it's really a sign that you're interested in improving something. Yeah. It's all of that and more, though. It's not just that if you don't ask for help, you may not get to where you want to go. It's arguably a really, really selfish stance. And I'll tell you what I mean. I'm in a helping profession. I love being of service to others. Yeah. And even people who aren't therapists or doctors or nurses typically feel good. I, I would say, I, I do not think it's an exaggeration to say the vast majority of people feel good if they can feel helpful or needed or, or when someone comes to you for advice mm. or with a problem, um, who said it? Someone articulated it. That's an expression of trust. Yes. It's selfish to rob that of the people in your life who would want to help you. you know? Just like it's obnoxious to not take a compliment. <laughs> people don't think about it that way, yeah. right? They think, oh, well, I'm being humble. No, yeah. you're basically telling the other person when you deflect yeah. That you think their opinion is caca. Yeah. And that's not okay. Like, yeah. accepting a compliment. I had to learn that. Yeah. It took me years, and I teach people how to do it. Mm. Yeah. It's so funny. When we do exercises sometimes with grown, grown, grown people, grown folks, mm. as they say. Yeah. And people cannot be comfortable just receiving a compliment. Yeah. It's something that I've struggled with, both the reaching out for help and the receiving compliments. And I, I wanna talk for just a minute about one of the ways I work through that. Something I talk a lot about in my content, but also on my podcasts, is you, one way to really amplify your therapy and the benefit of therapy is mm -hmm. to understand the processes of sensitization and desensitization. Mm. Receiving the compliment, receiving that love, of feeling attractive or whatever it is, if for whatever reason you're not accustomed to that, and it, it sure. may be your fault, it may not be, it is your responsibility to right. learn how to receive them and learn how to ask for help. When it first happens, it may be really overwhelming to your nervous system. Oh, without question. You know? Without question. And I'm not, I'm not casting blame on anyone and I'm not saying no, shame on you. you are. But I'm saying it's something we have to learn to do. Yeah. Because you're receiving a gift, which you yeah. take a birthday present from somebody and just open it and throw it on the ground right in front of their face. Yeah. Well, why would you do that with their words right. that were there to give you right. something, yeah. to build you up, to edify you? And for those who are listening, if that happens the next time you accept a compliment, it is therapeutic and transformative and healing to actually say, I'm sorry, I'm working on that. Thank you. you know, it's it's really uncomfortable. I'm actually going to feeling panicky. I'm going to leave now. But but thank you. You know, like you can be a little messy with it. You know, it's okay. You can eat. Life is messy. You can be messy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But guess what? Practice makes habit. Yeah. Not perfect, but habit. And the more you can mm -hmm. just say thank you and smile and receive it, the more comfortable you will be, and mm -hmm. the more. Compliments you can receive and give out. Yeah. And that's a form of love. That's a form of self-love that we've been talking yeah. about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We have to wrap up in a few minutes. Uh, before we talk about where to find you and how to follow up with you, is there anything else you want to say or discuss or any questions or just as we kind of wrap up uh, what's been a lovely conversation? I know I've enjoyed myself. Oh, you are such a darling. Yeah. I I mean, we could talk for hours as we totally. do when we get on the phone just talking. <laughs> um, you know, quite honestly, I just, if I could leave the audience with one message is that, again, you, you are amazing. Yeah. Just your mere existence. It, it's so special. Even mm -hmm. when it doesn't feel like it, um, I'm here to tell you that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. We talked about so many good things today. How can people follow up with you? How can they learn more about Inversity? So my name, I'm very fortunate, is not very common. There are not too many <laughs> Kareths out there. So I have my personal website, kareth.com. And I have my uh, Inversity website, which is inversitysolutions.com, mm -hmm. I-N-V-E-R-S-I-T-Y solutions.com. And I take this, this loving programming to organizations, um, 
colleges, universities, I mean, I'm, I, I take it wherever they will have me because I think it's really important that we have a, a very different conversation around diversity and inclusion, one that is truly inclusive and one that is empowering mm. and one that really does bring people together so they feel excited and engaged and inspired. Um, at Kareth Foster is my handle mm. for LinkedIn, for Instagram, Twitter, all that good stuff. Yeah. And if you're on Facebook still, I know <laughs> your audience <laughs> may not be. Be like, okay, dinosaur. <laughs> Even I CC my content to Facebook. There are people <laughs> using it. <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, well, thank you again. We'll have to have you on. There's so many other things that we can talk about. For those of you who are listening, uh, please like and subscribe on YouTube and Spotify. That's the easiest way to support this show. And remember, Therapy versus the World episodes are available early and ad-free when you subscribe to Luminary.